For our third and final lesson in Module 5, we're going to be looking at linear relationships and bivariate data. Our goal with this lesson is to use patterns in data to determine if relationships are linear or not. So essentially what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at graphs, we're going to be looking at tables, sometimes using those to write equations, sometimes not. But essentially what we're going to be doing is we're going to be mostly trying to figure out if a set of data represents a linear relationship or not. So does the graph form a straight line or does it form more of a curved line? If it's a straight line, it's linear. If it's a curved line, it is nonlinear. So that's where we're going with this lesson today. Now before we get it too far into this lesson, I want you guys to notice that um, providing the notes on graph paper on my, on my iPad, so you should be using graph paper as well. Um, and also, I want to go ahead and quickly define bivariate data for us to use that as we go through this lesson. Bivariate data can be defined as a set of data that is made up of two paired variables. So in most of our problems, we pair up our variables as x, comma, y. But any time that we have two paired variables, it's going to be bivariate data. Now, with all that being said, with this lesson, what we're going to be trying to, trying to do is we're going to be focusing in large part on the rate of change. Now, if the rate of change is constant, then the graph or the relationship will represent a linear relationship. On the other hand, if the graph of a relationship has a slope that varies, meaning that it is not a straight line, then the graph of then the graph is a nonlinear relationship. I'm going to go ahead and write that down so that you guys can write that down as well. All right. So again, if a relationship has a rate of change that is constant, then the relationship is going to be linear, meaning that the graph would be a straight line, or the table would have um, a constant values for delta y and delta x. Um, on the other hand, however, if a relationship has a rate of change that varies, then the relationship is nonlinear. So again, if you're given a set of data, some uh, ordered pairs, and you graph them, and they form a straight line, then the data is linear. Now one thing that you need to look out for, however, with that, is if you're given a graph or if you're given a table and there might be some missing data values, some data values that seem like they should fit within the table or graph, just because those data values are missing does not mean it is not linear. So you can have missing data values making it almost look like it's not linear, but that's still going to be linear if the line, if the graph is a straight line, or if the table has a constant delta y over delta x. So let's take a look at a couple examples of what I mean by missing data values and show how those still represent a linear relationship. So for this first example, we want to determine if this table represents a linear relationship or not. So we have x values of 5, 7, and 11, and y values of 10, 13, and 19. Now typically what we would do in a problem like this, we would try and find our values for delta y and delta x, and we would use m is equal to delta y over delta x to find our value for the slope. So when we take a look at this, we see that for our x row, our x row here, first we're going up by 2, then we're going up by 4. So right away that says something doesn't seem right about this problem. I'm not sure that this is going to have a constant rate of change. But then we go ahead and look at the y values as well, and we see that we go up by 3 here, and we go up by 6 at this point. Okay. Now, what we need to kind of do is we need to take a little bit of a step back and look at the patterns in the data itself. And if we look at the x values, we have 5, 7, and 11. Now to me, that seems to indicate that we're missing a value kind of right in here. Okay, maybe we're missing an, an entire ordered pair right here. And so we ask ourselves, what, what number would fit into that pattern? So we almost have to draw ourselves an extra row to go in this space right here. So I'm going to draw us an extra row. And so the next x value, if we, were to, if we were to identify the pattern, we see we're going up, going up by 2s would include the number 9. So then if we look at the right side of the column at the y values, 
if we look at what number we're missing in this pattern here, we're going up by threes. So this number right here would be 16. And so now we have, if we, if we kind of slide that column in, or slide that row in, I'm sorry, we see that we have a constant rate of change. Because we're now going up by 2 each time for the x values, we're going up by 3 each time for the y values, so we have a constant rate of change of 3 over 2. Now conceptually this might be a bit more difficult to understand with a table than with a graph. I think that once we take a look at a graph next, it'll hopefully make a bit more sense. But essentially when we started off, we, did, we had this table, and we thought that maybe it didn't represent a linear relationship, but if we add in that extra point, that 9 comma 16, we then are able to more easily see that the table does represent a linear relationship. For the second example, we have a graph that represents the cost for a pizza, or it shows how the cost of pizza changes as the number of toppings also change. So if we get a pizza with zero toppings, we see that the cost of that pizza should be $8. If we get a pizza with four, four toppings, we should see how that pizza would cost us $14. Now in this graph, we don't have values, or we don't have ordered pairs for one, three, or five toppings, but we should still be able to kind of make, an, make a guess as to how much the pizza would cost based on the number of toppings that aren't listed there as ordered pairs. So for one, three, five toppings, we should be able to still be able to identify that those points would fall on the graph. We don't know exactly what their values would be. I'm going to put a point here, a point here, and a point here for one, three, and five toppings. And again, we don't know exactly what that cost would be because it's kind of more difficult to read from a graph. But we know that it's still going to be linear because the points will fall on the graph. For a third example, we're going to take a look at a problem in which we're comparing simple and compound interest. Now, uh, if you've never heard of simple and compound interest, um, just let me say that compound interest is always going to be better uh, as far as a return on your investment. And I'll show you why in this graph. So I'm going to give you a table with some values of money that you could get from interest uh, over different year intervals and I'll show you what the graph of those data values look like as well. So for this table, uh, we're starting off with an investment of $200, and for both interests, we're, uh, our interest rate is 5%. Now with the uh, green simple interest, it's a simple interest rate of 5%, meaning that we're going to continue to uh, apply the interest only to the $200. With the compound interest, however, we're going to apply the 5% interest, to the previous amount of money that we had. So we're not going to go back to the 200 each time. We're going to go back to the number directly above the number that we're on now. And I know that might not make sense, but we'll figure it out as we go along. So taking a look just at the simple interest first, if we apply 5% interest to $200 for five years, we're going to end up with $250. Now from years 5 to 10, we're again applying 5% interest, but we're applying the interest to 200, not to 250. So again, years 5 to 10, we're going to make another $50. From 10 to 15, we're going to make another $50. And from 15 to 20, we're going to make another $50. All right, so that's simple interest. Each year, we keep on going back to the 200 to apply our interest rate to. However, with compound interest, we're going to go back to the previous number that we just wrote down. So in the first five years, using earning compound interest on an annual basis, we're actually going to make, going to make $255. So $55 there. Now from years 5 to 10, we're going to bump up to $326. And then from years 10 to 15, we're going to bump up to 416 and then from years 15 to 20, we're going to bump all the way up to 531. So clearly, earning compound interest is better for your return than earning simple interest. But let's take a look at what this would look like graphed. Now when we go ahead and graph both of these, we're, both of them are going to start off at the order pair 0, 200 right here. But then for the simple interest, which I'll graph first, 
Again, we're going up by 50 each time. So our first point will be, will be here. For 10 years, it's going to be 300. For 15 years, it'll be 350. And for 20 years, it will be 400. All right. And so our money is going to keep on compounding in that simple way year after year. Okay. Obviously, that will give us a linear relationship. When we look at the compound interest, however, we start off in the same place. We start off at 0, 200. Our first order pair is going to be at 5, 255, which is going to be just a little bit above my green point there. But then at year 10, it starts to kind of take off a little bit more. We have 10, 326. We have uh, 15, 416 which I'll put about right there. And then we have 400, I'm, I'm sorry, we have 20, 531, which I'll place about right there. Now, these, these points are not plotted perfectly, but what we can see is the beginning of a curved line. Okay, we should see how we end up getting a curved line there. So with compound interest, your money is going to make money for you, where with simple interest, you're just going back to the original investment. So clearly, you're going to make more money for yourself if you're able to get a good compound interest rate to help you save and earn money. Now, the point of going through this whole problem is not necessarily to teach you guys about simple versus compound interest. However, what I wanted to show you is that our green line here, even though my line might look a little squiggly, our green line is going to be represent a linear relationship, while our purple line is going to be a nonlinear relationship. Okay, we have a straight line for green and a curved line for purple. So green is linear, purple is nonlinear. Now, one more thing that I want to say: suppose you know the slope of a linear relationship and one of the points that its graph passes through and you want to figure out how you can predict another point that falls in the graph of the line. What you could do is you could find the equation of the linear relationship using the slope and the given point, and then insert any x value to find the corresponding y value of a point on the graph of the line. Now that might seem like just a bunch of mumbo jumbo, but hopefully as you work through your homework, you'll understand how I'm trying to help you out with that. All right? Now, with this lesson, we wanted to use patterns and data to determine if relationships are linear or not. I'm hopeful that you guys are able to better see if a relationship is linear or not. And please, if you have questions, um, don't hesitate to ask. I'll tell you guys right now that some of the homework problems, especially the graphs, might be a bit frustrating um, in trying to find what the, um, what the rate of change is specifically. So if there are problems that you are stuck on and you cannot figure out what the uh, what the rate of change is or something like that, please don't hesitate to ask, ask me and we will figure it out or I will give you credit for trying to figure it out. All right. Again, write down any questions and we'll talk about those in class.